Thanks. Whoa. Thank you, guys. Um, um, needless to say, um, this, is, um, <laughs> this is awkward. <laughs> oh, I think we've got a bad wheel. That's all. We got a bum wheel. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we it's okay. I think we lost it. Aha. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Did we get it? Yep. I think more or less, huh? I'm Charlie Nelson from this church, and it happens all the time. And now I now I know why this is up here. <laughs> I should have known when I saw duct tape in the, in the lectern that something was amiss. I should have known when I saw duct tape in the lectern slot here that... Um, We're we'll taking here. donations for a new podium. <laughs> <laughs> so reach into pocket two right now. <clears throat> uh, needless to say, as I sat here listening, I had a couple of thoughts of my own. Um, one of them is something I just forgot to uh, mention to you, and it's certainly one that I think is, makes a lot of sense. One of the practical pointers that he makes um, is that when you are putting volunteers on various committees, it's good to know how what kind of givers they are. Uh, you don't want someone who has made the same puny, you know, relatively modest pledge year after year after year after year after year heading up your canvas, you know. You want somebody who knows about giving. Um, if you, uh, I've got some sort of a capital project you're trying to get some enthusiasm built up for, it's good if you can find somebody who gave to the last capital project to help head it up. Um, so that's one thing that, um, uh, I think we, most of us sort of intuitively know that, but it's another one of those places where often it's the minister who sort of has to make the call as to who's going to get that, and so it's important that they know who are the people that, you know, are apt to be sort of philosophically aligned with the project and who are going to be able to speak from experience about uh, generosity. Uh, one other thing, and then I, I'm going to ask for, I guess I'll ask for sure. How many of you have had somebody say to you, you know, I give to so many other organizations, um, and, uh, you know, I just, I can't afford to give that much to the church. Um, you know, I, I give to, you know, in my case, I give to PETA, I give to ASPCA, I give to all sorts of political causes, da da da, da. Um, well, I, uh, I, I, you, you know, you don't want to argue with people, but I, I have a way of kind of dealing with that myself, and um, that I think it's a, a fairly sensible rejoinder to people who say that, uh, which is to say, look, I don't think you should tithe to the church, but if you are not, you know, in serious financial trouble, you should be tithing to the world. And give half of your tithes to the church and the other half to these other organizations. I mean, most of us, I think it's fair to say, are in reasonably decent financial shape compared to, uh, you know, what, what might be the case. I know that's not true for all of us, and some of us are feeling very insecure, and I'm going to ask a question to the panel about that in a minute. But, but my sense is, my feeling, one of the reasons that I do give to the church and everybody is I feel lucky. I mean, I feel really lucky. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm able to put food on the table. I can watch television when I want to. And I mean, I, you know, I, I think about the vast majority of the world doesn't have anything like the kind of discretionary income that I do. And it just almost feels like I'd be doing the wrong thing if I wasn't giving away a substantial portion of it. Now, I don't want to, I don't think you can guilt people about that, but, but I think it's, you know, one of those things that makes you feel lucky. You know, I feel lucky that I can afford to give it away. And, and, and I do give to a lot of other organizations, but, I mean, the vast majority of what I give is to the church. So, so those are just two thoughts that occurred to me. Now, I do want to put this question to the panel because um, the reality is we are in sort of hard times right now. Um, and I would like to know how you think we can deal with folks who are in financial distress or uh, it's sometimes it isn't so much they're in distress as that they are in anxiety about what might happen or what, you know, uh, you know, whether their job is secure, whether their, you know, pension is secure, whether their savings are secure. And, you know, how do we go about uh, trying to reach out to people in these kinds of times? So, whoever wants to pick it up? Who wants to jump in? 
pick it up. <laughs> Well, I can tell you one thing that we did. Um, Joan had sent around an article from a congregation in Indiana, I think it was, that had offered to um, give the person's money back if they weren't able to make their pledge, if they um, had <coughs> lost their job or something like that. Like they, they were employed at the time that they made the pledge, but you know they were afraid they were going to get the pink slip in a couple of weeks, that you know pledge based on where you are now. And then if something happens, then come back and talk to us. And um, we made that offer. No one's really taken us up on it. Every year there are some people who aren't able to make their pledge. And we deal with it. In some cases, we've done things like um, we had a penny campaign. You know, bring your spare change into the church, and then we'll be able to make up for these pledges for, you know, we had a lot of people who had to move away because of their, to find work. And um, the, our penny campaign brought in $7,500. Wow. So I mean, it was wow. it was not a penny campaign at all. It was people saying, "I can I can help to compensate for those people who truly want to help but can't because they lost their job or they had to move unexpectedly." So that's just one thing we did. We have not actually offered a money back guarantee or anything like that, but um, I have. Yep. Yeah. We've never offered a money back guarantee or anything like that, but I have had multiple conversations letting people know that they can modify or cancel their pledge at any time. Uh, we, I have had people talk to me specifically about fears for the future. It's, it's not as formalized maybe, but it is this idea that, that you are not bound, the church is not gonna sue you if you don't fulfill your pledge or anything like that. We do also print that on all of our pledge cards. I don't know if anybody reads it because it's been there forever. <laughs> um, but that is a, sort of just a, a consolation maybe I can offer to people. We do, however, have a guy named Vinny on the staff. <laughs> yeah. I think understanding is certainly critical. Uh, the, as I said before, the act of people who won't make a pledge at all versus people who have had to reduce their pledges or think they might have to reduce their pledge. I tend to think participation is the key, like the United Way often tends to say, or in your office, United Way campaign, that kind of thing. Participation is the key. Even if you only commit a hundred bucks or something, that's a pretty low pledge for a year, but it's at least the act of pledging and participating as opposed to refusing to pledge at all. Um, many people have had to reduce their pledges because of you know, lesser jobs or reduced income and that brings up another issue that my church I know got into this year. We were struggling a little bit to meet goal and they actually did sort of a second ditch email to a number of people saying, you know, your pledge is okay and we appreciate, this was not a quote, <laughs> <laughs> your pledge is okay and we appreciate it, but gee, you better think about increasing it. Um, and I'm not sure what the reaction to that or how successful that approach was. But it, it rubbed me a little bit the wrong way and was, came off as a little bit strange. And I'm not sure if that backfired or not or was very successful. I think a different way you can word that is to say, what would you like to give if you felt able? And to start with where they're at, you know, or what were you thinking? And then, because it's a pastoral issue, it's really not about money so much as their anxiety about right. their situation. And so that has to be recognized. I think it also goes to... Uh, Mr. Uh, Christopher's point about diversifying the funds. I mean, we hear that all in our own lives, you know, diversify, diversify, diversify. But get from those three pockets, start planning now um, for those hard times. And um, you know, that's, that's one thing that we always do. And uh, I think the nonprofit world is, we're already thinking about the next project, the next mission, you know, what we want to add. And, um, you know, again, why the, that does cost money. Well, it needs to be formed in the um, the language of, of mission. Um, I think that that's really important, and I think it's even more important in these hard times to talk about you know the mission of the church and um, why the mission's even more important, and dollars are even more important in these hard times to give and the good that the church does. So I, I think you know he he offers some good strategies in there. Right. I mean, one of the things I remember that he says in the book is that. Um, 
and he's speaking specifically about the minister at that point. He says, the minister should always be ready to give an answer if someone comes up and says, I've got some money I'd like to give to the church. What, what can you use it for? Um, I mean, obviously the minister could say, you know, it's been a really cold wind from Rita's calling, but that's probably not the right answer. Uh, um, and I think that the point is, is that you should, you should always be thinking about, you know, what's the next, what would be the next project you could undertake if you had some more money? Because it is surprising. I've, I've had this happen to me myself. People come up and say, you know, I've got $10,000 I want to give to the church. What's the best thing I can do with it? Um, and often, if you're like me, the mere, you know, a mere bean counter, all you can really say is, well, yeah, we could put it in the endowment fund or something like that. But if you're, if you've got an ongoing sort of uh, long-range planning process, you might say, well, you know what? We've got exactly the right thing for that. We need a, a special ramp here, or we need, you know, something else like that. Or we need the money to renovate the kitchen, or whatever, you know. Um,